There is no such thing as architecture. There is the spirit architecture, but it has no presence whatsoever. What does have presence is a work of architecture. And at best, it must be considered as an offering to architecture itself, merely because of the wonder of its beginning. It was certainly one man's faith and one man's vision, but a lot of people helped him in his office, in his life, and over there. Throngs of people help. This is a man who really loves humanity. The last job he was here, he died at dinner here. So I saw him at that. When he died, he was four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. He was on his way home from a trip to India, and then he never showed up. He apparently collapsed in the men's room. In 1985, I was given a scholarship to travel to Dhaka, Bangladesh to study a building designed by the celebrated architect Louis I. Kahn. From the time it was designed and built, Khan's famous parliamentary complex, Shere Banglanagar or the Tiger City, was the beating heart of this newly formed democratic nation.
When I saw the complex for the first time, I was unprepared for the raw emotional power and poetic beauty of these buildings. As a romantic 24-year-old graduate student, I was intoxicated by the wondrous form Khan had conjured for the beleaguered people of Bangladesh. As I made my way up the red brick plaza, the building seemed to vibrate. I remember breathlessly staring at the Mughal-style cutouts under the intense tropical light. The buildings were just as the critics had described, giant toys dropped from the sky. I had never seen anything like it. I was pretty sure nothing like it existed. The buildings looked futuristic and ancient at the same time. The complex seemed to hover a mysterious universe that looked like it had erupted only moments before from the barren rice field. Yet, it also looked firmly rooted, as if it had been there from the beginning of time. At the time, Bangladesh was governed by a dictator who had suspended the constitution. The corridors, parliament chambers and assembly halls were empty, a constant reminder that democracy was frozen. I walked through these desolate passageways awed by the forms that Khan had created. It was a Pyrenean dream with connecting bridges and brick walls that soared like ancient ruins. Light slashed through the clear story, softening the great expanses of concrete. From that singular moment, Khan's Tiger City became my near obsession. Architecture, according to Khan, should have great weight, gravity, mass, and monumentality. Khan loved to call it architecture of silence and light. And the movement of silence to light, light to silence. The full story of Khan's Tiger City had never been told. But on that day in 1985, I knew that's what I was going to do. I wanted to travel in Khan's footsteps, to see what he saw, experience what he experienced, learn what he had learned in order to understand how this American architect came to South Asia to build his masterpiece. What experiences had given him the ability to understand a culture so different from his own? You can never separate a great work of art or architecture from its context. And Louis Kahn's parliamentary complex is no exception. In order to begin to unravel its story, I needed to understand more about the Bangladesh into which the project had been born. I start my journey in Calcutta, where my own family roots originate. Calcutta and Bangladesh are geographical and cultural neighbors and share many things in common. This part of the world was formerly known as Bengal, and it has a turbulent and storied history. Dhaka was the entry point of the spice trade and famed for weaving and textile manufacturing in the pre-colonial days. The Dutch, the Danes, the French, and the British were all here for the lucrative market. Modern Bangladesh has a complicated history too. It is closely tied to the tumultuous history of the subcontinent. By the mid 20th century, Dhaka's name was synonymous with floods, poverty, and overpopulation. How did this once prosperous region decline so precipitously? How did it go from bread basket to basket case? Oh. 
living here in Dhaka is Inayat Khan, a historian and former freedom fighter. He witnessed firsthand how those tumultuous times shaped the Bangladesh that we know today. Hey, you can see, oh, in fact, the skyline of, of uh, downtown Dhaka. This is one of the nerve centers, as you call uh, you know. Hey, look at this. <laughs> it's total chaos, but not a single accident. What can you tell me about the city life and historical Dhaka? We have a history, a recorded history of 3,000 years. All these archaeological sites and the museums, these are all along the banks of the rivers. This was a center for education, center for knowledge. Nothing. At one point, Bangladesh was one of the biggest trading hub in the world. And during Shaista Khan, the Mughal ruler, yes. they had ships flying from all over the world, bringing, taking muslin, a 30 feet long muslin could squeeze into a matchbox. It was so fine and refined. European observers noted that the local traders were so busy exporting goods, they didn't have time to count their gold coins, but weighed them instead. It is in the history that even our muslins were used by the pharaohs to cover the, uh, the mummies. Egyptian, Egyptian pharaohs, pharaohs they yes, used, they yeah, the, to cover the wrapping uh, for wrapping the mummies. Dhaka might be the oldest, uh, you know, occupation. Uh, so it, this was one of the oldest textile centers. Centers in the, in the world. And now again, it's becoming a major the textile capital, capital of the world. This is, yeah. <laughs> In 1947, after an exhaustive and expensive world war, England was ready to divest itself of its colonies. The Muslims of South Asia wanted a safeguard of their own country to the Hindu majority. Before granting India its freedom, Britain partitioned the country, carving of two regions with majority Muslim populations. The result was a new state of Pakistan, in 47, uh, the rulers left and decided to divide the Indian subcontinent on the basis of religion. So all the Muslim majority places were part of Pakistan. So we ended up East Pakistan and West Pakistan with a distance of a thousand kilometers with two different cultures, two different languages, and the rest uh, was India. And with this division, a massive and violent upheaval took place as Hindus and Muslims fled their millennia-old homes. Partitioning led to the largest migration in history, and the deep psychological and political scars are still evident today. When Pakistan was created, they wanted to impose on us their language, Urdu, and they said that that would be the state language. And in fact, that created, that sowed the seed of the Liberation War. Because Why Urdu? Why not two languages? Yes. That's what, I mean, in that's Switzerland, what do you have yeah. how many languages? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here, um, I think the Pakistani rulers were very, I would say, short-sighted, and they thought that they can impose that language on us. The divide over the official language was only the beginning. Islamabad became West Pakistan's new capital. It was politically, economically, and linguistically dominant. In East Pakistan, Dhaka became known as the second capital and was far less influential. East Pakistanis weren't enthralled. In 1962, as political trouble brewed in the East, the country's second president, Ayub Khan, initiated a second official capital within Dhaka, calling it Ayub Nagar, or the city of Ayub. The seeds of divisions were sown, and the East Pakistanis began to clamor for independence from West Pakistan. And in fact, that language movement laid the foundation of the Liberation War. In March 71, Pakistan started a military operation here to suppress the people. And there 10 million people just fled away to the other part of Bengal, 10 million. And that created huge instability within this region. And it caught the eyes of the international world. It was a long struggle, but then we were able to get our own independent, sovereign country. When did you get your independence? 16 December, 16 19, December. 
71. That feeling of 16 December, uh, I can't explain. This is beyond my, uh, you know, my description because we were so much overwhelmed with this joy of freedom. And uh, we were flying our new flag. So that was a very, very different feeling. But then from this massive destruction to yeah. build this country, it was a huge challenge, but we faced that challenge. Bangladesh's challenges were truly daunting. They faced deadly genocidal war, coped with millions of refugees, experienced flooding on an epic scale, and suffered massive food shortages. But today, in stark contrast, despite all its apparent problems and under the decade-long leadership of a woman, Sheikh Hasina, Bangladesh has performed well. Its economy is humming. The Nobel Prize-winning invention of microfinance has spurred serious development in women's education. And the country has been able to tackle natural disasters and make serious strides in healthcare. These are heroic achievements and Bangladesh is attempting to move its population from low to middle income status to continue its upward economic growth trend. And we have been maintaining a growth rate of uh, nearly 7%, uh, which is also endorsed by World Bank. Bangladesh can be a happy and stable country. And how many million people? More than 10 million people here. A very vibrant, lively city. And Bangla language is the seventh or eighth most widely spoken language. And we have got many Nobel laureates for this literature, for peace, for economics. So this Bengal, you know, what Bengal thinks today, India thinks tomorrow. I think the world will think tomorrow. Dhaka is anchored by the Buriganga River, which crisscrosses the plains of Bangladesh with its many tributaries. There are more than 700 rivers coursing through the country. They are its greatest assets, providing ample marine life and creating fertile soil. And those same rivers are also the country's greatest liabilities, flooding its plains and wiping out homes and villages. Louis Kahn's staff encountered the devastating flood of 1971 that killed half a million people firsthand. What do you think of the complex Louis Kahn design? It's an architectural marvel. We are very proud of that building. That's our parliament. And Bangladesh being a democratic country, we think our parliament is the house in the right uh, building. Yes. Yeah. We should go inside. You have come at a time where Bangladesh has a different beauty. Yeah, I know. Beautiful. And, and this is another beauty. Yeah. After. I love rainy season. <laughs> I never get fed up of rain. Now, a plan as against a room is a society of rooms. The rooms must talk to each other. How much the plan, a society of rooms talking to rooms, can become alive if you make that which is a good place to live in, a good place to sleep in, a good place to study in, a house is only great when it's great for the next man, not only the client. As I'm wrapping up my visit to Dhaka, I bump into an old friend. Sundaram. Deborah Winger and I know each other from our days at Oxford University. What are you doing in Dhaka? I'm making a documentary on Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn? You're, you're going over to the parliament building? Deborah had never seen Tiger City, so I offered to take her out to the complex.
Bangladesh Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Today Parliament is closed, so you can take shots today, and again you can come. We love to. I love to come back here many times. <laughs> Maybe after monsoon season. I mean, I just keep saying this, but it's dark outside today. So that's sort of magic. <laughs> it seems lighter in here than it did outside. And it's like spiritual light, divine light. And that's what it's supposed to represent from the pantheon, light from outside. So I have a question, I guess, that brings me here. It's always the same question for me. How does a person use their light? their own light, the light that's given to them. And sometimes you can find the light in the nature of a place, and sometimes you have to make a path. It's very interesting if you see these joints. As a modern architect, you couldn't create decorations. So these joints, these corner joints, they became the decoration. And so that's why you had these ribs placed in the marble. So contrast between concrete and marble. If you're dealing with concrete, you must know the order of concrete. You must know its nature. What concrete really strives to be. Concrete wants to be really granite, but can't quite manage. And the reinforcing rods in it are a play of marvelous secret worker that makes this so-called molten stone appear as marvelously capable. You gotta put it into absolute glory and that is the only position that it deserves. The human beings have created art for 60,000 years before any economy, before any history. And out of that need for creating art, came about the idea of shelter. You're working with visual artists all the time. And then you made this lead to this, to this obsession that you have. And so you need to come to a place that is, like it exemplifies the need to create. So it was this building that created this obsession. It's not with architecture in general, but specific to this building and this man. You are drawn to something, but then someone acts up and catalysts. Something happens to you in your life and, and moves you. And this building has moved. So many things come together for me walking in here for the first time. I mean, it's, I think, maybe part of what his dream was, because look at its function. So, if you think about uh, the idea of need, so man needed to make noise to scare wild animals away, and then he made music, what is that? That's desire. So there's so much in this building that is hopeful. And you're standing in that room, and you just hope that the people that come here will be inspired by this light and the silence of this building. I think this may be your church, Senor. The parliamentary complex and its distinct architectural planning includes the arcades, colonnades, terraces, gardens, and lakes, where geometry reigns supreme. Surrounded by the lingering presence of Louis Kahn, I walk everywhere, soaking in the architectural forms that he created. This architectural wonder also serves an important function in the day-to-day -day business of governing this nation. 
As part of his official duties, Squadron Leader Saar walks the plazas and the hallways of Tiger City every day. This is like the Congress of the United States. In this building, we have the office of the President, Prime Minister, the key parliament actors, they have their offices here. When you walk through the passageway, the labyrinthine process, and you're walking through the parliamentary complex, what does it feel? It's such a building, it uh, makes you emotional. In the morning when the light comes, the inside of the house gives you a spiritual feeling. And in the evening, light is strong, the lights are reflected in the floors. It gives really amazing beauty. How did Louis Kahn build such a daringly modern and monumental building in this culturally rich but economically shattered country? How had an Estonian-born American who was known as an architect's architect managed to win such a high-profile commission nearly 10,000 miles from his home in Philadelphia? What force of will enabled him to build a capital city on the tabula rasa of the rice fields of Bangladesh? The next step in my journey is a stop in Washington, D.C. I'm here to meet Sajib Wasid. For him, the governing of Bangladesh is a family affair, and Sajib offers a unique perspective. His grandfather, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, played a key role in the Bangladeshi freedom movement, and his mother, Sheikh Hasina, is currently the prime minister. Where were you born, Sajib? I was born in Dhaka, right in the middle of our War of Independence. So uh, my grandfather, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, had been arrested. He'd uh, been taken away to Pakistan. Uh, we declared independence, and the war uh, Pakistanis attacked the midnight of 26th March, 1971. And uh, my grandfather would have become prime minister of entire Pakistan. But the Pakistani government, Yahya Khan, at the time, would not let parliament assemble. The story of how Louis Khan came to Bangladesh is a convoluted one. To start, the commission was first offered to Le Corbusier, but he declined, saying he was too busy finishing Chandigarh, the capital of Punjab. Next, they reached out to the Finnish architect Alvar Alto, who agreed to attend the meeting. The circulating story is that Alto missed his plane to Pakistan due to excessive drinking the night before, allowing the opportunity to slip away. Finally, they called Louis Khan's office on Walnut Street. Khan, in his characteristic way, asked, when can I start? Ironically, it was the Pakistani military ruler, Ayub Khan, who initially reached out to Louis Khan to design the second capital. The parliament building was actually started by the Pakistani government. They wanted to build an actual legislative assembly building for the legislature of their East Pakistan province. But subsequently, of course, we declared independence, won our independence, and so it was necessary for us to have, uh, obviously, our own parliament building. We didn't have one. It's essentially a beacon of our freedom. Did your grandfather interact with Louis Kahn? Yes, uh, my grandfather met with Louis Kahn several times. He had some input on his own vision and ideas of what the parliament should be. It was very important to have a parliament building that was unique, not just another grand uh, traditional building, and that it was designed by someone like Louis Kahn, someone who would be renowned and recognized world around. That 
Bangladesh has arrived. As I walk around Washington, D.C., I realize that I'm surrounded by the symbolic grandeur of American democracy. The architecture of this city reflects the high ideals of this nation. The U.S. Capitol building, the White House, the mall and monuments. These buildings embody and communicate the aspirations of the American people. Maybe this was Louis Kahn's inspiration as he drafted the plans for Tiger City. Lear Levine is a documentary filmmaker who was on the ground at the time of Bangladeshi War of Independence. He used his camera to capture the conflicts and human drama that unfolded during the revolution. He tried to make a film that reflected uh, how the people lived, how the farmers worked and their daily life and the poetry of the land. How exciting it was just to look into the eyes of the Bengali people, the wisdom they seemed to project, the way they moved, their gentleness, and the horrors that were inflicted on them. When I was there during the actual conflict that uh, was their war for independence, there were still bodies floating in the water that hadn't totally decayed. It was horrible. The roads were packed with people who escaped with only their lives. They were living in cow sheds. They were living in the fields. They were dying in the fields. The International Rescue Committee, um, institutions from around the world were trying to supply them with, with goods. One time we were in a refugee camp and I was with my assistant and I was confronted by two men. One had a cover that completely shrouded his face. The other was a, a wild-eyed young man who was holding on to him and guiding him because he couldn't see with the cover over his face. And they ran up to me when they saw me with the camera and then he pulled the cover off the other man's face and there was no face. It was gone. It was, uh, probably one of the most painful experiences of my life. Uh, it was tough. And the fact that they were so gentle and the world did this to them, I found them uh, extraordinary people. I still do today. I can't wait to go back. I was uh, to be a painter. There was no question about it until my last year in high school when a course given on architecture just hit me so strongly as something that I wanted to be associated with. The course was given on the earliest architecture, Greek, Roman, Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance. I felt a great happiness that I had no question as to what my career would be. Louis Kahn was a man driven by his passion to create. Throughout the course of his life, Louis Kahn spoke about fairy tales, and his love for them was spurred by his origins in a romantic land, populated with castles, turrets, and citadels. Every fairy tale requires a castle, and Khan designed one for the people of Bangladesh. At the turn of the century, Estonia was still part of Tsarist Russia, and Khan was born there in 1901 into a poor Jewish family. Enchanted by burning embers, at the age of three, he picked up a brick of hot coal, which then set fire to his apron, and he was badly burned on his hands and face. 
Khan would carry these scars for the remainder of his life. It was a humble beginning for someone who would later become a defining force in the course of modern architecture. In 1907, the family emigrated to America and settled in Philadelphia. Not only did Khan grow and discover his love of architecture there, but it served as his professional and personal home base for the rest of his life. Despite the family's financial struggles, Louis Kahn went on to train in architecture at the University of Pennsylvania, graduating in 1924. In 1930, he married his wife, Esther. Sue Ann Khan is the oldest of Khan's three children. She was his only child to grow up with her father as presence in day-to-day -day life. We lived in a house that belonged to my mother's mother because they were married and the depression hit. And they couldn't afford to live anywhere else. Normal Philadelphia row house, three stories. My mother was really the main breadwinner. He played for silent movies. He worked his way through school that way. He loved to improvise at family events. He would sit down at the piano and play. And he was very fond of playing the St. Louis blues. And he would be all over the keyboard, up and down, you know, just having a lot of fun. He was going to be an artist until he discovered architecture when he was 16 in high school. He didn't know that you could be an architect, and he found out. And from that point on, there was a love affair, the great love affair of his life, which was with architecture. At family dinners, he would talk about his work, and we'd all be quiet and listen. It wasn't like, and, and how are you? <laughs> <laughs> or what do you do? If he had something to present, he would be working all night. An architect friend of mine um, told me that, you know, two in the morning he called up and said, this model is crap. You have to come back to, you know, this guy's asleep where you have to come back and, and fix it. How is it that he never built a home for himself? He said, I have a very romantic idea of home. I'm not exactly sure when the Indian trip started. He would come back with tales. So he said, I went to a dinner and he said, there was a servant behind each person and uh, it was just like a fairyland and he would, he would talk about life over there. These influences show up in his work, especially in Tiger City. It's the first time where my father was able to realize his a sort of overall plan. Um, so many projects, such as the Salk Institute, he imagined a whole campus or a whole plan, but he was never able to carry that out beyond one building. Here, he was able to really express a larger plan, and he was able to create a whole campus. And this is something he dreamed about uh, from the beginning. He dreamed very big. And it's an aspect of his work that people don't see in the United States, and that I haven't seen, except on the drawing board. Built during the same period as the Dhaka complex, the Corman House is one of only nine private homes designed and built by Louis Kahn. And it is where I am meeting Harriet Patterson. She was romantically linked with Kahn during his later years, and he wrote to her about his experience of seeing the Tiger City site for the first time, and the inspiration he was gathering on the visit. This was January 30th, 1963. This is his first trip. The site is a no man's land, completely without distinction. Not a contour, not a distant landmark. I was driven around in a Jeep, all the time thinking of what can make it worthy of the thoughts I had before I saw it. 
Then it dawned on me to include in the assembly a mosque. Religion is the basis of separation from India. When I presented that afternoon the idea of an axial relation of the assembly complex and a mosque, it was as though heaven descended on the authorities. They said, you have put religion in this capital. Just what it needed to give the meaning it lacked. A very few architects. I mean, it's not just Lu Khan, but very few architects in the world have had this kind of commission. I know. Right? How many people get to design a kind of a mini city? Corbusier. Corbusier is at the tail end of his life. So if you look at La Corbusier's the city planning that he did in Chandigarh, absolutely stunning architecturally, but it feels it doesn't really belong there. When he traveled on the subcontinent, went to India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, and saw the cultural plans, the vernacular, the landscape, how different it was. And he responded to it. Oh, the great plaza that he created in Bangladesh is inspired by what he saw in the subcontinent. I think that's one of the things that Corbusier, for example, <laughs> missed. He came up with something that was iconic, but it's indigenous. So to me, it feels like a citadel surrounded by water. A solution that has affinity with the culture out there. Definitely, he sent me a postcard which showed a monastery in Bangladesh, which was surrounded by water with a built mound, exactly. And um, it was a prototype, and it certainly influenced him. And the uh, use of water is a very important element. And to come up with forms that um, are iconic, but not had not been used before. I mean, there are 50 different forms of openings. 50 different forms of openings. In the assembly. Nathaniel Khan, Louis Khan's youngest child, was with Harriet Patterson and born in 1962. My memories of my father are very, um, they're very distinct because I don't have a, the continuity because he didn't live in our house. He visited our house often. And the things that I did with him and that, he, that we did together were very intense. They're, as the poet William Wordsworth used to say, they're spots of time. Like a dappled sunlight, you know, there's a lot of murky stuff around it, but the spot is really bright. I remember my father coming to the house and telling me stories about Dhaka. And he just seemed filled with ideas, mystery uh, of this incredible place. But I remember how much he was taken with the Bengal tigers. And Lou liked that power very much of the jungle, of the tigers, of the rain, the monsoon, and of course, Dhaka. So it begins, and uh, you know, eight years in, Civil War, 1970-71. They had to close the field office, pull people out of there. Only now are we beginning to find out that, that was a, there was a genocide over there. However, he was working for both of these places, both East and West Pakistan, and in India. And India. And India. After construction had begun on Tiger City, it became ensnared in global politics due to the Civil War. 
Despite an influx of money from American aid groups, 10 million Bangladeshi refugees crossed over into the Indian state of Bengal. Richard Nixon, who was the American president at the time, turned a blind eye to the Pakistani military crackdown that led to the mass exodus. The Nixon Kissinger administration gave unconditional support for the Pakistani junta leader who was covertly helping the administration open relations with China. This led Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to reach out to the Russians and Louis Khan's half-finished complex became an Indian military hideout where a warplane crashed on the presidential plaza. Louis Khan continued to work on the project even though the client had changed. But during that time, there was no communication, no money. The building had come out of the ground a little bit, quite a bit, but my father kept working on the project and he kept paying his people to work on it. He kept doing the drawings. And people would say, Lou, what are you doing? They're having a war over there. Why are you still working on this project? And I mean, it's, it, what a marvelous comment, he says. He says, there will be a time when the war is over. And then they will really need this building. So there is this sense, once again, of, of you know, of an architect who's been asked to do something. Just because there's a problem, <laughs> you don't stop. Because the ideas you've been asked to, to work with is needed even more now. And there was that sense in him that I've been asked to do it, I'm gonna do it. And he was right. They needed the building then more than ever. It was a new country. So you've been to Dhaka. What, <clears throat> what were you feeling? I wanted it to be a pilgrimage. I also didn't want to just kind of see the building from the side of the angle or something. I wanted to get a full frontal vision of this building. So I asked the uh, guy who was taking us around to blindfold me. So he drove me through the streets and took me to the edge of the access road, led me out by the arm to midway in the big field. And he said, can you feel it? There's no question, you can feel that building, even with your blindfold on. You walk away from the traffic and things start to get quiet, and then you feel this presence. And he said, are you ready? And I said, yeah. So he took off the blindfold. And uh, I, I wept. It is enormously powerful. One can't do something like that unless one has truly responded to the specific place people needs. And I think he, he did that. And that was, that was uh, you know, boy, it, it uh, almost makes you wish you were an architect. <laughs> the unmeasurable was the one thing that captivated the mind, and the measurable made very little difference. It is just born into us. The will to learn, the, the desire to learn, is just one of the most, uh, uh, the greatest of inspirations. Louis Kahn achieved an almost mythic status partly through his work and partly through his wildly popular lectures at Yale and later at his alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. He personally molded a generation of architects and profoundly influenced a host of others that never studied or worked with him directly. To 
Today, the University of Pennsylvania houses the Louis I. Kahn archive in the same building where Kahn taught his students. I was curious to find out if anything in their collection could shed light on Kahn's Tiger City design and construction. The archive was co-created by Henry Wilcots, an associate of Louis Kahn's who worked closely with him on the Dhaka project and was responsible for its completion. What was exactly your role? I served the office as the project manager. Once we got things underway there, it was a very, very exciting period. I was going out to Dhaka two, three, four times a year. So when you first got out there, they had stockpiled. And they showed Lou this brick. Yeah. And it didn't work. But Lou was the kind of a person who said, but we will find a way to use it. So what did he do with that, those bricks? They crushed it for aggregate for the concrete. They also only gave him 200 acres to begin with, which he promptly said wasn't large enough. You have to understand, this was the so-called second capital. So therefore, it had to be smaller than what was happening at Islamabad. You know, at the end of the war, when Lou was invited out, I accompanied out there. We met uh, Sheikh Mujibun. You know, he at that time had become the prime minister. And we were ushered in and we sat and talked with him and Lou talked about the building. He was a wonderful man. I liked him. He would just grab hold of you and hang on to you, you know. <laughs> He told us uh, that he didn't need air conditioning. He said, because, he said, we can't afford it. Lou told him, he says, but that's all right. Maybe we'll just open some windows. Well, the Sheikh liked that. <laughs> Back over in there, you know, is the, uh, the medical building. Ah, we'll go and have a look. Let's go have a look yeah. then. Yeah. Richard... There are medical laboratories. Yeah. 237. 500, right? Yeah. That was his most important building at the time. It was new. It was his theory of, of servant spaces. The development of Kant's theory of served and servant spaces was a pivotal one. He believed there should be a separate space for mechanical and utilitarian functions, such as heating and cooling equipment, freeing living spaces to achieve their full glory. The Richards Medical Research Laboratories marked a turning point in Kant's career. It was in this complex that Kahn's theory of served and servant spaces reached their first full expression. It was here that Kahn shocked the architectural world by fusing the modernist aesthetic with the ancient forms he had observed in his travels through Europe. Before the Richards Building, Kahn was a beloved, if relatively obscure, academic architect. After the Richards Building, he would become the internationally acclaimed star architect. He would remain until his death. Years later, I was out there one holiday on the site, and finally one fellow said, pardon me, sir, where else is this building? And I says, no place else. And he says, is it in the UK? And I would say, no. And he said, is it in the US? I said, no. He says, are you telling only in Bangladesh? I said, yes. And he turned to his people and he says, Bangladesh, very lucky. No other place. So, so let me ask you something. You know, he worked in so many places. Ameri working in America is very different from working in India or Bangladesh. Mm or in Iran, mm. or in um, other... And working meaning culturally is very different. Mm. Sometimes those cultural differences could block other people, but mm -hmm. Lou seemed to have thrived. Why? What was in him that enabled him to drop all of those superficial boundaries 
and get to the heart of the matter. Because he was a full person. He could do that. Lou could tell you a story and you say, where did he learn this stuff, you know? But he could pick it up. It was part of it. He could make it his own. Where do you think it came from? There was a well. Yeah. I don't know. I think the key to Khan's open-minded nature lies right here in the bustling avenues of his native Philadelphia. The vibrant street life and mix of cultures he witnessed as a child left an indelible impression on the grown man. And we can find echoes of these streets in all his works up to and including Dhaka. It was here in these nondescript offices of 1501 Walnut Street that Khan devised the blueprints for many of the late 20th century architecture's greatest masterpieces. Visitors were struck by how pedestrian and unassuming the offices were, with peeling paint and overflowing ashtrays. But to Khan, this was merely a staging ground, a place to push himself to the brink in the pursuit of greatness. The importance of a drawing is immense because it just simply, it, well, it's, it's, it's the architect's language. Even the drawing which, this looks like a flower, for instance, this looks like, like a canoe. It doesn't make a difference. The mind makes it what it wants to make it for the purpose of discussion. So therefore, the drawing is very valuable. Fred Langford and Gus Langford work for Khan in the Walnut Street office and also on site in Dhaka. Lou asked me if I wanted to go to Dhaka. I said, yeah, sure. There were times when there must have been 500 men on the site. They all lived on the site. Yeah. They had little lean-tos and tents, and they would sleep, do their own cooking there, and go home maybe once a month for a day or two. And they carried everything on their heads. It's amazing. They were, had little shovels, unusual type of shovel. Kutals, a kutal. A kutal. Then yeah. they put it in a basket and then walked their way out with a basket on their head. And one of the greatest things was they, when carrying these things, they couldn't move their heads, naturally. So they felt with their toes when they came to the end of the board or the scaffolding to dump. The first drawing I made for him was for Pakistan. And Khan was there, and David Wisdom took the pencil out of his pocket, and he scribbled on my drawing. And Lou slapped his hand away. He said, don't touch that drawing. Don't touch the drawing. Yes. And he, he revered it. Yeah. And he really had utter respect for the drawn line. What was he like in person? I can remember once in, um, in Pakistan, his back hurt him. And he, he, he had some liniment and he wanted me to rub him down. I don't know if he wants stories like this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I put some liniment in my hands. He took his T-shirt off. And I could see he was bolstering up his, his upper torso <laughs> so I could see it, you know. So he was quite proud of his physique. Yeah. There's no doubt about it, yeah. Here I'm working for this great architect, and he's just like the guy around the corner, you know. They, they feel his muscle, you know. <laughs> I think that he approached the job once he got it in a very possessive way. He wanted to leave his stamp. I heard that he worked all the time. He was always on the go, there's no doubt about that. Even when he was relaxing, he was, he was thinking and moving, yeah. He never ate meals on time, never slept yeah. properly, and so he didn't really take good care of himself. No. He was so interested in the project and, and, and consumed by the projects. Oh, he manipulated other people, because he was a manipulator, he was an artist at it. He had to get something done and he, he, and I don't think, and I don't mean that as a, as a criticism. He spoke in poetic terms constantly. Absolutely, yes. The walls separated and the columns became. Yeah. Things like, or what? A rose knows it's going to be a rose, so a rose wants to be a rose. You know, and a brick wants to be a brick. Right. So treat it like a brick. He's above and beyond the normal architect. 
He's poetic. Design is to put into being what realization form tells us. You can say form is also what is detected as the nature of something. And design strives to at that moment employ the laws of nature in putting it into being. allow light to come into play, this resource of material to make, to put into presence, this the maker of presences, at that moment only do you put the measurable into what you are doing. Previous to that, everything is fundamentally or tightly unmeasurable. was exploring the theme of light and shadow in his other designs. Commissioned by Paul Mellon, the Yale Center for British Art brings a monumental presence to downtown New Haven. Khan designed the interiors to allow in as much daylight as possible, thus bathing the art collection in soft, diffused, natural light. Carter Wiseman is a Louis Kahn biographer and a professor of architectural history at Yale. The design for the building was very highly developed, but Kahn had not told anybody what the outside was going to be finished in. And Jules said to Kahn, Lou, uh, Mr. Mellon would like to know what the building is going to be finished in. And Kahn said, steel. And Prown was horrified. He said, Lou, have you ever seen a building clad in steel that you liked? And Khan apparently said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but now, as we see the building 40 years later, you see why. Because the metal has responded to the weather in a way that discolors it. But since we're talking about late modern architecture in which you can't use conventional ornament, then the discoloration becomes the ornament. One of the great structures of our time is Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. Designed in steel, or for that matter, titanium, and 40 plus years later, I realized that the steel-faced building's genealogy could be traced back to Khan's museum at Yale. The Yale Center for British Art marks another important point in Khan's career. Beginning with the Yale Art Gallery, everything he did was for an institution of higher purpose. The Salk Institute, we were supposed to cure cancer. The Exeter Library was all about the idea of learning. The assembly building in Dhaka, this was a birth of democracy. And I can imagine he felt the mission of that was something he could enhance with his art. And that's what he did. What he did. I promise not to embrace the column. Um, <laughs> this is one of the most uh, remarkable and unlikely spaces I've ever been in. So I wanted to ask you a little mm. bit about Bangladesh and mm -hmm. Dhaka. What do you think Luke Khan was thinking when he went to the site, he saw the blank canvas, tabula rasa? Khan's buildings never were particularly responsive to a landscape. Unlike Frank Lloyd Wright, yeah, if you think of falling water, it's entirely about the site. Khan's buildings really wanted to be on a tabula rasa. 
So there was one. He was so good at absorbing other cultures and other ideas that through osmosis, I think he probably sensed what was the right thing to do. How does this man come to intuit cultures as foreign to him and then have the work accepted as if it was part of the fabric? More than the light, it was the movement of people in that building that animated it. And as you know, Kahn grew up in Philadelphia in the Northern Liberties, which was uh, a slum, a ghetto. He spent a lot of time on the street. I wonder if at some level he was connecting to life on the street in Philadelphia. The assembly building has those concentric rings and unexpected cutouts and openings so that you see people, just as we're seeing here. Part of the story visually here is being able to see a cross at this fellow on his horse. My sense is that he was a deeply sentimental man, but also that he was a great idealist and that I think at some level he thought maybe humanity could, could be perfect. What do you think that Dhaka project meant to him? Well, he spent so much time on it, and I think in the end it killed him. What is it about this architect that arouses such passionate reactions? As I'm walking the streets back in New York, I bump into architect Chris McVoy in Chelsea. His designs embody the spirit of Khan's theories of architecture. Chris suggests that I sit down with his partner, the renowned architect Stephen Hall. Just before Khan died, Hall was set to begin work with him at his studio in Philadelphia. His work is greatly inspired by Khan. For me, Lu Khan represents that kind of deeper th uh, thinking and deeper dimension of architecture, which I really think is more important than anything today because everything is so uh, quick and uh, Twitter feed uh, short and uh, lack of deep thinking. Uh, we're, we're in a, a strange moment in our society. and. Uh, so I think it's reassuring to go to a place like Amanabad and see how strong those spaces are. These uh, affinities drew me to want to go and work for Khan. He's producing this architecture monumentality of gravity and masses at a time when there's this architecture of glass and steel and corporate efficiency. How do you think he was able to break that ground? You need an idea to drive a design, to bring all the the, the manifold pieces of architecture together, the site, the program, everything. In the Exeter Library, he said the essence of a library is to take a book from the darkness to the light. And that's why the reading carousels are all around the perimeter of the building where you can go in to the light. He gets to Bangladesh. He's never been there before. He's 10,000 miles away. Right. And he's given this tour. What do you think he was feeling at that particular moment as an architect? He rewrote the program and he brought the mosque into the complex. So he brought that spiritual space as a central figure in the making of the, the whole geometry and the architecture. He was hesitant to present it that way, but then they loved it. When you're walking in and you feel, oh my, it's sublime. Khan was influenced by Carlo Scarpa. He loved Scarpa's work. But you can feel the, you know, the influence of one architect to the next, to the next, to the next. There's a famous text that Kahn wrote um, sort of three years before he died. 
called How Am I Doing, Le Corbusier? I said, he cared so much about Le Corbusier, he really cared. And so that's a kind of handing down of, the, of this kind of transcendent thoughts about architecture. Bal Krishna Doshi was a young architect that worked with Le Corbusier and later went to work for Khan. He was the one to break the news of Corbusier's death to Khan. Doshi told me the story. He came to see Khan to pay his respects, and then he arrived in Philadelphia on a Sunday night. Khan was sitting there, and he, and he said, have you heard? And Doshi said, yeah, of course, I was just there. And Khan said, now, for whom shall I work? Yeah. You know, I think that's part of architecture. So I always thought if I could invite Khan to my building, what would he say? You must ask the brick what it wants or what it can do. And if you ask brick what it wants, it'll say, well, I like an arch. And then you say, but uh, arches are difficult to make. Uh, they cost more money. I think you can use concrete across your opening equally as well. But the brick says, oh, I know, I know you're right. But, uh, you know, if you ask me what I like, I like an arch. <laughs> to experience a new aspect of Khan's legacy, I pay a visit to Four Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island. This is a unique opportunity because although Khan designed the memorial in 1973, it is being constructed posthumously. Gina Polara is the architect in charge of the project and she walks me through the site to explain the impact of Khan's design. He was really thinking about the beginnings of architecture. This work is Egyptian. In the battered walls, in the large dimensional stone, in the way that we even had to barge the stone to the site. Also the idea of memorial, that is an Egyptian idea yes. in many ways. Yes. Khan talked about the memorial and he said, I had this thought that a memorial should be a room and a garden. That the room represented the beginning of architecture and the garden was sort of a personal control of nature. This idea of the room resonated um, with Roosevelt because Roosevelt felt that all the problems of the world could be solved if people sat together in a room as a rounded dining room table and discuss the problems. He linked this back um, to, to Roosevelt, who he considered to be someone who had saved him as an architect because the Roosevelt policies um, that set up the Resettlement Housing Act, for instance, allowed him to practice as an architect and to support his family as a young architect. So this meant more so, to him. So for him to do build a memorial to FDR meant was, had deep, deep meaning for him. But he was also very idealistic. Everything yes, he that was. he did yes. had a higher purpose. Yes. Whether it's this memorial or the Salk Institute exactly. or the DACA for the purpose of government and democracy. Khan was idealistic. He did believe that architecture fundamentally changes how you occupy a space. I mean, it's the idea of, you know, the thoughts that you have in Rome aren't the thoughts that you have in Paris. I had a lot of arguments with people when we started this project. They said, well, it's so expensive because it's $50 million now. Why don't you just make the block out of concrete and put a veneer on it? And I said, absolutely not. Khan would have never done that. The walls parted and the columns became. That's also the genius of Khan. You know, you can look at the photographs, you can, but you don't really, really get it on a cellular level until you're there. I understand why people travel all over the world to visit Khan like a pilgrimage. This one has a direct relationship with Bangladesh purely because of the liquid geography. Also, you're talking about heads of states and are you talking about memorial in that yes. respect and then becomes a memorial to, to their freedom struggle. That's right. And you look out 
to the United Nations, which is the built embodiment of the four freedoms. So there's a very deep connection between this site and that organization, so which... He's having a dialogue with Corbusier every day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The quotation that will be on the back of the niche says, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. Architecture affects how we live and interact with each other as human beings. If you have bad architecture, it affects you. And Khan gave that gift because he understood that what he was making was a sacred space that made people, that, that, that evoked that kind of response in people to make them want to lift themselves up. You know, you would just mention that the cost of this is $50 million? Yes. What if I said the whole cost of Bangladesh is less than that? Would you be surprised? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There can be no doubt that Liu Khan was an essentially an American architect, but it is impossible to understand his architecture without acknowledging one of its primary influences, the ancient forms of Europe. In 1928, Khan toured Europe for the first time on what was then known as the Grand Tour. He roamed the canals and cobble streets of Venice, viewing the palazzos and churches and letting the grand architecture of this ancient city wash over him. Venice was also the location of Khan's only project in Italy, the Palazzo dei Congrezzi, one of his greatest unrealized works. Khan died before the design was completed. Arriving in Rome, I pay a visit to the prestigious American Academy where Louis Kahn spent a fellowship year in 1951. Christina Puglisi of the American Academy in Rome gave me a tour of the complex. It's a place for work. And you can see it, I think, reflected in the architecture. It's very simple, white walls, white ceiling, very spartan. You have a small bedroom and very comfortable studies near the library. The quiet, everyday studio life. What's amazing about this place is the interdisciplinary nature of it. You may sit next to an archaeologist, or a painter, or a classicist, a poet. As we were walking around the academy, we knocked on the door of the room that Khan supposedly occupied while living here. We met the architect John Garrett, who is staying in the same room. from the United States, even though he was trained in the Beaux-Arts tradition, uh, he has never seen masses like the Pantheon. 
I think very few buildings like that exist in the United States. So what so do you he think came happened? here and um, he was surrounded by all these masses. Wherever he traveled, I think he noticed that the typologies that are timeless um, are very simple and uh, grand. And I think a great thing about Khan's work in Bangladesh is also related to a fact that is almost never mentioned. And I think that is the composition between architecture and landscape. The composition with water features, alleys, terraces, colonnades, arcades. Um, when you go to the Peloton, you, you find this uh, in a very strong and powerful uh, composition. Architecture is more than just buildings. The world of the 1950s, 60s, moving towards the glass and steel. Why is Khan reverting back to these architecture masses? I think simply because he was here in Rome. And having this great moment of... Khan explored the winding streets of this eternal city, he must have felt like he was walking through history itself. The Pantheon was completed by the Emperor Hadrian in the year 126 AD. When it was built, all the lands from Scotland to Palestine were united under the banner of Rome. For almost 2,000 years, the Pantheon has stood, and every day of those 2,000 years, light from the oculus at the dome's apex has slowly traced the interior. bathing the countless generations below in soft gleam as they traverse the rotunda. Adnan Moshed is an architectural historian and helps me understand the importance of Khan's visits to Rome. Khan was the deeply committed architect who wanted to create architecture, buildings that would be timeless. In the same way, the Pantheon would appeal to people of all cultures. There is a sense of universal beauty. When you look at the oculus, the light beam filtering in from heavens, it overwhelms everybody who enters that building. I think that left an indelible impression on his aesthetic consciousness. That beauty uh, was not necessarily has a very specific locale. It can have some kinds of universal resonance. I think his challenge was to combine these two, East and West. Khan had a very revered stature among the architectural community in Bangladesh. These massive cutouts are actually windows at an urban scale. They are not meant to be a little window for a house. They are windows for the city. They are semantic tools to communicate with the city. I think if you look at all these projects collectively, there is an overarching theme. That overarching theme is light. How do you create a luminous environment inside a building? If you go inside the parliament building, you walk around the ambulatory, you will see that natural light, it creates an ambience. I think it was this sense of timelessness and a kind of a mystical element that would appeal to people of all cultures. I think Kant's work combines a kind of a peculiar phenomenology of the site. If you go to parliament, you will also feel that mystical power. 
but you will also have an element in some ways Bengali it's a kind of a microcosm of the Bengal Delta a place has a spirit and the architect's role is to condense that spirit into the building so I think Louis Kahn was working on multiple fronts During both his visits, Khan found inspiration in other European cities. In Greece, Khan visited the Parthenon. Built in 447 BC, it is considered to be one of the pinnacles of classical Greek architecture and has an impact on generation after generation of architects. Louis Kahn was inspired by the structure of the building, studying the refined excellence of the workmanship that he saw. He observed that Greek architecture is absolute in its sense of alternating light and dark, solid and void, created by the rhythmic drama of the towering columns. When Louis Kahn said, I could make the material sing, he was speaking of lessons learned from his visit in Greece. This influence translates to his later form, as seen in the Kimball Art Museum, for example. Khan was drawn to the archaic forms in ancient architecture, such as the Temple of Aphia. So I paid a visit to the island of Aegea. After taking the ferry and the driving, and then hiking up the hill, I finally arrived. But I got there too late. The temple was all closed up. But I wanted to see what Louis Kahn saw and wasn't going to return empty-handed. So I jumped over the barbed wire fence and explored the great Doric temple. During my travels, I learned that Khan had a special reverence for archaic forms rather than classical architecture. This prompted him to visit and study the ancient Greek temples of Paestum, Italy. When he asked, what does a building want to be? He was envisioning a powerful archaic beauty, much like he created for Dhaka. During his tours of Europe, Khan didn't limit himself to architecture of the ancients. He traveled all over the continent, soaking up a wide variety of architectural traditions. In Paris, I went to see Le Corbusier's home, Maison La Roche. Louis Kahn revered Le Corbusier in a way that he regarded no other living architect. And I can imagine him here, moving through the space in a trance. While traveling in France, I hear about the internationally renowned Vitra Design Museum in Rhine, Germany. There they were featuring a major exhibition of Louis Kahn. I jumped at the chance to see it for myself. Once I arrived, I met with the museum director Jochen Eisenbrand, who gave me a curatorial tour of the exhibition. It's really a, a career that split in two halves. Until, say, around 1960, he was uh, not that well known and he was almost 60 years old when his breakthrough came and the first part of his career he was uh, mainly preoccupied with um, housing uh, workers housing and i think that is one of the reasons um, for his uh, interest in the social role of, of architecture he had of course the, the trenton bathhouse that was personally very important for him and was already recognized by a small crowd of, of architects but then really the big breakthrough, no doubt, were the Richards Medical Towers. You can really tell that after that, he also sees himself in another way and starts to see what he does or his drawings and models that they actually have a value. I mean, what he did was so different from 
what everybody else did. It was uh, it was the height of the international style, of international modernism, of building with glass and steel. And he brought back weight and mass, creating distinct spaces. He was speaking about eternal values of architecture that may have been pushed aside a bit at the time. There's a great appreciation of his work among the fellow architects. India, ancient and modern in the same breath. Is it any wonder that some of the most famous modern architects were intrigued and attracted by the chance to work here? As I make my way through these familiar lands, crossing India from west into east, all around me I see the color and culture that inspired Louis Kahn, and I hear the echoes of Tiger City in the fall of my footsteps. Eventually, I'll cross over into Bangladesh and back to Dhaka. But before I travel that way again, I decided to visit the Taj Mahal. Louis Kahn visited the monument in 1965, and it seems fitting that I make an attempt to see this wonder through his eyes. In the year 1631, the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan's beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal, died during childbirth. Overcome with grief, the Emperor ordered the construction of a great tomb, a mausoleum, the crown of palaces, otherwise known as the Taj Mahal. It is regarded by many as the world's finest example of Mughal architecture. A style that combines elements of Islamic, Persian, Ottoman, Turkish, and Indian architectural traditions. It took 23 years to build, just as long as the Tiger City. Chandigarh was the first planned city in post-independent India. The master plan of the city was designed by the legendary Swiss-French architect Le Corbusier. It was a period in the subcontinental history where feverish city building activities were taking shape. And Louis Kahn looked up to Le Corbusier and visited Chandigarh to see the new city being built. important collaborator in India was Bal Krishna Doshi. Doshi spent many years supervising projects in India for Corbusier and then later for Louis Khan for his project in Ahmedabad. When Corbusier passed away, Khan mentioned that every time I did some work, I thought Corbusier would look at it somewhere, this work and he might think about me. So that was his reverence for Corbusier. And I said, this is the city where Corbusier has done four buildings, and I would love you to do a campus. And that's how Khan came. He said, he wrote somewhere that, um, that I live in a beautiful city called La Corbusier. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was, a, he was always very philosophical, you know, very enigmatic very often. So then I took him to the clients. I told Lou, I said, there are some problems. We have foreign exchange problem, we have financial problem, but we want you to do this work. So shall we write an agreement? He says, why should we write an agreement? Two, he says, I trust you. So there is no agreement. It has never happened in the history that it could be like this. Khan was all the time trying to break his own rules and find another rule and yet be himself. He deeply connected. He was a with great them. storyteller, great teacher. He says, you know, today is uh, Friday or Saturday, and I have a class on Monday. He says, I have to leave tonight. Can you believe somebody coming from USA just to come for a day to see a building? In fact, he never liked to see the buildings. He came, he would come here, and he would avoid visiting the site immediately. 
scared, in love, you know, whatever you call it. So he was actually a very different person in terms of how his, rela his relationships were uh, fragile, you know, sacrosanct, very delicate. It's like an offering. Many times linkages come from far away, unknown sources. And I think those are the sources which link time and space. And that is where the real creativity happens. He was here and he was reading about Buddha. And he says, what a life this man had, Gautam Buddha. Then after four days, you know, I found that he had not reached home. Well, you talk about premonitions, you talk about values, you talk about how certain things uh, occur. What do you mean by that? Well, that is what meditation is about, that you go inside and you, the world will be there. Khan always talked about being a fool. If you remain a child, you have all the possibilities to do what you want to do. So when I talk about Khan as a yogi, it's almost like saying that, you know, you are, a, you are all the time in front of something which is ephemeral. We as architects talk about buildings, buildings, but that for him building was not a building. It was a very sacred act. Though she takes me on a tour of the buildings for the Ahmedabad Institute of Management, which Khan designed in 1963, this is where his subcontinental journey begins. looks immense and grand, like the classical Indian building. This silence that he talks about, you can see, really, at you this can feel moment. it. It's, it's got real gravity in it. I mean, it's the weight is there. And you feel, I mean, when he said, I love the Pantheon, it, it has a kind of resonance. Yes. Also, if you look at it, the openings are very few on the walls. Yeah, why is that? Well, because you don't want to see everything here. This plaza is important. So they accentuate only certain entries. You can cross there. You can come into this entrance here. It's very much like the medieval place. This is Khan's great public building of a scale which you can't talk about the treasury of spaces and places. And here you'll find that treasure. It is, it is Indian, it is Mughal, it's classical. It was in 62 we started and uh, the last day was in 1974. 12 years is coming here looking at India, looking at people, looking at the culture, looking at the warmth of the people and learning about how things can happen. I don't think he ever worked on any project for 12 years. On another continent, with very simple materials, practically one, two materials only, basically brick. And then the technology was very, very simple. So he was actually challenging himself about his search for this almost absolute nothing. He was really touched by, by Buddha. Yes. He says, what does the brick want to say? So what would the life want to say? Khan used the word offering. And this was his offering to architecture, to humanity, and to the citizens of the future world.
as I travel back to Dhaka, I'm struck by the many complexities and contradictions of modern Bengal. Rapid economic growth alongside endemic poverty. A young democracy barely on its feet, rooted in one of the world's most ancient civilizations. Consider where does Shere Bangranagar, the Tiger City, and Louis Khan himself fit into all of this? An architect can build a house and build a city in the same breath if he only thinks about it as being a marvelous, inspired, expressive realm. really like to know what you felt when he found out that he died at Penn Station. I came home and it hit me. I said, why am I here? My father's not here. It's the only time, only reason I ever come home was to see my father. And it, it was like, you know, a stab through the heart. I realized, finally I allowed it to hit me that I would walk in there and he wouldn't be there. writing is so um, spiritual. And I think anybody who, who, who knew him uh, loved him. The art of architecture. That's the <laughs> deepest contribution you can give. I mean, uh, I, I really believe that's something that transcends. The inspiration and the possibility and the hope of art you know, Osip Mandelstam, the poet, said, people need poetry like they need bread. I think Khan would agree with that. To evoke a sense of spirituality. But it is a primal sense of spirituality. Weeping inside Louis Khan's building is not too uncommon. It has a visceral presence that is overwhelming. Yeah, I shed a tear. For him, for it, for the idea that human beings would have the audacity to make something like that. Here in Dhaka, Louis Kahn designed a capital complex that is beloved in the country and is imbued with a compelling narrative tied to the history of South Asia. His design elicits an intense emotional feeling that's a far cry from the glass and steel building that surround us everywhere. Straddling design and philosophy, he has left an indelible imprint on the world as one of the great visionary architects of his time. Khan gave his creative impulses and fantasies free reign. He dared to dream in a way that few would ever find the courage to match. Architecture is more than just a building, more than just a roof over our heads. Great architecture can impart a sense of hope, of possibility. It can move the human spirit. Ah! 
I realize in the end that I'm responding to the grandeur of the architecture, the silence, the light. I'm enthralled that he was helping a new democracy define itself. I'm responding to all of this. But after walking in Khan's footsteps and talking to those who knew him best, I realize that my obsession is tied to something more basic. Khan's generosity as an artist allowed me to participate in the creative act. For me, that is what makes Sherry Bangalore, the Tiger City, Louis Khan's greatest offering.